Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a blessed Sunday. Uh, once again, it is an honor and a privilege to be uh, in the presence of God once again. Uh, let us start off in prayer on this, on this beautiful Sunday morning here in Atlanta, Georgia. And wherever you are in the world, I pray that God is blessing you and keeping you during these uh, tumultuous times. But we do know that the God, He, he, is, uh, is, he is in all places. He is omnipresent. He is omnis omnipotent. He is uh, on the uh, on the science, he is he is he is in everything and in everything and everybody. So we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are today. Thank you for allowing us to wake up to see another day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you once again for allowing us to come together once again as men and women of Christ. We want to thank you for allowing us to be able to praise your holy name just one more time. For we know it is but a precious gift today, Lord, that we uh, know that tomorrow is not promised to any man. So we want to thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us yet again today. Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Saturday after Saturday, you are there blessing us and keeping us for a specific purpose, which is not for our own sake, but to serve you, to serve you, the only uh, uh, true and living God. So we thank you, Lord, because we love you and we fear you. And we know that we have to try to do our best to do your perfect will, for it is only your will that is going to allow us into salvation, to allow us into paradise. So we're going to do the best we can in the time that we have. So bless us and keep us. Forgive us of all of our sins. I pray that someone's heart will be uh, transformed today and that they may be able to go out and tell others in this dying world about the good news that Jesus Christ came and died once, and he died once, and he will come again and receive us into himself. So that where he is, we may be there also. So bless us and keep us today in perfect peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. This particular week, we're going to look at the Beatitudes once again. We're going to look at Matthew 5 and 5. Uh, Reverend Pitts, thank you for joining us. Matthew 5 and 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if I wanted to put a, a sermon title to this, The Power of Silence, right? Oftentimes when we think of the meek, they are the ones who are very quiet. They're very, uh, uh, I don't want to say complicated, but sometimes they're off into a corner and they're in their own mind. They're in their own spiritual state, right? And we, we cannot discount that because these are true believers of Jesus Christ. The meek, the power of silence, right? And we're going to give a few examples of that in this particular passage today. But let us start off. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Right? Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, right? and let us put on the armor of light. Amen. So good morning, saints. What I wanted to talk about today briefly, if you give me just a few moments, I want to paint a picture. There's an author by the name of Isabel Wilkerson, and she wrote a book called The Great Migration. And this is something we all must keep in mind, uh, not just uh, African Americans, but everyone uh, here in the United States, because uh, he our history is your history. It is the history of our great nation. And this is going to point to the great migration. It's going to point to the meek. Who are the meek, right? And this is just a classic example of who the meek are. For we know that everyone, every nationality throughout this world, throughout the United States, right, for example, has been through something, right? that has transposed, that has moved them from one destination to another. And we wonder, how did that happen, right? The meek. So give me a few seconds. The Great Migration took place from 1915 through 1970. And Isabel Wilkinson is the author of this book. It was during the, war that, it was during the First World War that a silent pilgrimage took its first steps within the borders of this country, right? The fever rose without warning or notice or much in the way of understanding by those outside its reach. It would not end until the 1970s and would set into motion changes in the North and the South that no one, not even the people doing the leaving, could have imagined a, uh, the start of it or dream that it would nearly take a lifetime to play out. Historians could come to call it the Great Migration. It, it would become perhaps the biggest underreported story of the 20th century. It was vast, right? It's, it was leaderless, right? No one said, let's leave, right? Let's leave the South or let's go North, South, East, West. Let's, let's leave. No one said anything. It was leaderless. It crept along so many thousands of currents over so long a stretch of time as to be difficult for the press truly to capture while it was underway. It was just happening for whatever reason. So over the course of six decades, right, some six million 
African Americans left their land of their forefathers and fanned out across the country for an uncertain existence in nearly every other corner of America. Hmm. The Great Migration would, would become a turning point in history. It grew out of the unmet promises made after the Civil War and through the sheer weight of it helped push the country toward the civil rights revolutions of the 1960s. So during this time, a good portion of all African Americans alive picked up and left the tobacco farms of Virginia, the rice plantations of South Carolina, the cotton fields in East Texas and Mississippi, and in the, and, and the backwoods of remaining southern states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, North Carolina, Tennessee, and by some measures, even Oklahoma. Many were townspeople with, with nothing in their uh, names except their, the, nothing in their arms except their King James uh, Bible and their old 12 string guitars, right? Some were, uh, were tradesmen, uh, some were pastors and they were trailing their flocks, right? Seeking something but not knowing what it is, the Great Migration. I would come to believe that on the brink of this great migration on prior to my great-grandmother would take part in this migration. She was owned by slavers, but it, would, uh, but it would be many others that would follow her and many like her after she reached the grasslands of Oklahoma from Texas. So these were the meek, right? Another class of the meek, those that didn't cross the turnstiles of Ellis Island. They were already citizens, right? But where they came from, they were not treated as such. The meek. Hmm. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 11 and 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, get this, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. When Christ died on the cross, right? And when he arose again on the third day, right? That the prayers of the saints went into heaven. And that we, the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles and the Greeks, everyone who believed in Jesus Christ, all these prayers began to be received in heaven, meaning we took it by force, right? We forced our way into heaven, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. These are the meek, if you want to uh, paint a picture about this. Three points for today's message, right? The meek are not weak, right? The meek are those that are diligent about seeking Christ and all his righteousness. The meek bow to no one but Christ, right? Remember the story of, 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 of Elijah, right? I have 7,000 that have not bowed down in Israel to Baal, okay? These are the meek. The meek have transcended their humanity. They focus on their religiosity and purpose, right? They have transcended their humanity. They have forsought who they are as a human and said, you know, there's something bigger than myself. There's something bigger than my very existence. There must be something ahead. There must be something in my heart that's going to transcend me, that's going to push me into salvation. Amen. They have a purpose. They realize this. this are, they, these are the meek. How many times in Scripture, I'm asking you this question, have we seen the righteous forsaken? From Genesis to Revelation, you've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's people begging for bread. Not only have we not seen the righteous forsaken, forsaken, but we have seen them blessed in the hope and the promises of God, even during times of unusual and unmet circumstances. Their focus is to inform and transform through words and deeds. Their life must be a vehicle, that it must be uh, an example to others to follow, that they may be able to find Christ, to find out who he is, right? So last week, right, we spoke briefly on Matthew 5 and 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, this particular week, our focus is not on those that mourn, but on the meek. Not the weak, but the meek, right? There's a major difference. It is the weak who need to know God. Many choose not to believe. Many simply ignore him. Uh, they are the ones who have no fear in their heart for God. For King Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. So it is a fact that choosing to trust in God, believing in him, shows great wisdom and great faith and great courage. These are the meek. For it is the unbelievers who wake up every day trying to find the answer to what, what is truth, right? Even though it is slapping them and staring at them right in their face, they're asking the question, what is truth? All the while, the presence of God is all around them. Amen. 
This generation is seeking a sign, Jesus is saying, right? And yet the sun illuminates across this blue sky, right? And it illuminates across our face when we wake up in the morning. It wakes us up every morning. God, the son of God wakes us up every morning. And we still say, what is true? Who is God? What is God? That doesn't make any sense. At night, we can walk in darkness, right? Because the moon gives us light, right? We can see the illuminated moonlight dance across our oceans and rivers, giving rhythm to God's endless movement, his creations, right? How many times have we been to the oceans and we've, we've walked the beaches at night and we see this, how, how, the, how the moon just transcends, how it, how it forms a light, right? A shadow, a beautiful light across the ocean, right? Which reminds us that, wait a minute, there must be a God in heaven. Where does this lesser light come from, right? For when I lay down tonight, I wake up and there's going to be a greater light in the morning. What is truth? Ridiculous. Every breath we take and every move we make, all carefully orchestrated by God, right? From the moment we took our first breath as an infant until the day we take our final breath, all given to us as a gift from God, the breath of life. We cannot take that for granted. That there is a time and a purpose for everything under the heavens. There is a time to be born and a time to die. One day we will all take our last and final breath, all orchestrated by God. So no, our talk is not uh, on the meek, those that will inherit one of God's largest creations, and, and that is the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the, the, uh, the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, right? No, no, no. And so it is the meek. These, the meek are these, these quiet seekers and believers in the Christ who will be rewarded immensely. Why? Because they are the meek, the ones who are praying out, the ones who have taken heaven by force, right? God is rewarding those that diligently seek him, which is the meek. The scriptures go on to tell us that the strong shall bear the infirmities of the weak, but truly it is the meek who are the strongest, right? For why would God give his inheritance, the entire earth, right? To one who cannot contend for the faith. Hmm. Those that have not believed nor, nor uh, uh, excised their faith, why would he entrust everything that he has, everything that he has created to someone who truly has not asked for it or truly does not deserve it because they chose not to follow Christ? They can't be persuaded. They can't be preached to. They can't be reached in the, in the dark crevices of the world when we try to uh, throw down a lifeline to bring them up. They deny it. They don't want our help. They simply cannot be reached because it is something that science doesn't provide an answer to them. They feel like there must be a reason why these trees behind me are so green, right? There must be a reason why this water came from some other place and they can't figure it out. There, there must be a reason why the sky is so blue and it, it can't be a God. There, there can't be someone who just snapped their fingers or just spoke all this into existence. No, 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 I can't, I can't take that. I, 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 I just can't fathom that. And so yet they wait for an answer, a scientific answer to try to figure out what's going on. All the while you have the meek who are praying for those, right? Who need Christ, who need understanding, who need the peace of God in their hearts, right? Amen. Hebrews 4 and 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached. Get this. As well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Right? There are two things that will take many people to hell in the last days or when they take their final breath. Right? Yes, I, I, I preached the gospel. People who have been in church for 40 and 50 years, yes, I preached the gospel. I taught Sunday school. I've done all these great things. I preached. I was a preacher. I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you had no faith. So God turns to you and says, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Until you decide to exercise your faith, to trust in something in the unknown, in the most difficult situations of your life, don't try to figure it out on your own. Trust in God and you will be rewarded. For unto us was the gospel preached. Get this, Hebrews 4 and 2. We could spend some time in this. As well as unto them. 
but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, what he's talking about in this, in this context were the Jews at that time, right? Many of the Jews continued, even after the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, continued to say that, no, the Christ has not come yet. I don't know who this Jesus Christ was, but he was not the Messiah. So we will continue to go to our synagogues and go to our places of worship and pray and pray and pray for the Messiah to come because he was not the one. For in two was the gospel preached. The gospel message was preached. And God appointed 12 disciples and they told other people. And so there was thousands of disciples after the death of Jesus Christ that went out throughout the world telling the gospel, telling the gospel message, the good news that Jesus Christ has risen. And he sits on the right-hand side of the Father, for we bear witness. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It did nothing to their heart, did nothing to shake the core of their heart, of their humanity, right? The definition of a person who is meek is, is one who is quiet, right? Someone who is gentle and easily uh, imposed on. They are very submissive, right? Keep in mind that being submissive doesn't mean that you, can't, uh, that you can exploit the meek. You cannot exploit them. You cannot manipulate the meek. You cannot abuse the meek. You cannot mistreat and misuse the meek, nor can you oppose the meek, for they have a focus a sincere focus in their life that they're going to follow Christ until the end. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you sway on. They're going to go right in the middle. I have heard the gospel message and I am going to follow Jesus Christ. Hey, it was Peter, right? When Christ one day said, uh, unless you uh, uh, eat of the bread, which is my body, and drink of the cup, which is my blood, you cannot enter in. And it says that many disciples walked away, right? Thinking that this meant cannibalism. But Peter said, no, 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 Lord. Christ said, you know, are you going to leave too? Peter says, no, Lord. You are the only one offering salvation. So, no, the meek are the heroes of the spiritual battle taking place all around us. For it is the meek who look upon things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It is the meek who are saying, you know what, there are angels watching over me right now. There is a spiritual battle taking place all around me. I, even though I'm trying to explain it to you right now, but you're not hearing me, you don't understand that there is a spiritual battle taking place around us at all times. Jacob said, I saw the angels ascending and descending from heaven, fighting this battle for us, keeping us safe while we are here on this earth. Things that are invisible to man. And so it is with the meek who are prayerful in times of distress and heartache. They pray for, they pray at the window like Daniel, praying for repentance, praying for a nation during a season of captivity. Picture Daniel, Daniel for a moment. And, listen, and, and picture yourselves praying for understanding when there is a lack of knowledge. I just can't figure this out, Lord. Praying for nationalism, praying for, praying for your children, praying for a reconciliation back to God, praying for all people to love and respect and fear God, praying for God's grace and mercy to fall upon all men, praying for a believing spirit through the overarching birth pangs of unrighteousness, praying not to be forgotten but remembered, praying for the present world as well as the future, and praying for God's destiny in the end in a world that takes from the believer's spirit and never gives back. Praying for all these things is the meek. Seeking an answer, seeking something, seeking substance, seeking something. Lord, just, just let me know that you're there, protecting me and guiding me, right? Come immediately, as I spoke a few weeks ago about David. David said, no, no, come quickly. I know you're there. I've seen you answer prayers quickly. We are the meek. The meek are those who are the anchor of God's heart, right? They are the ones who keep the promises of God, his love and his compassion grounded in the depths of this shaken world. The meek are always seeking and, and finding what is lost. They are knocking and the doors are opening to them. The, the, the meek, they, they seem to never stumble in darkness and, and God provides a double portion of strength to them. And so it is that the meek persevere even in times of darkness. God always keeps watch over his own. They are those that inhabit wastelands and 
build cities, right? These meek, when they, when they find those with a broken heart, they build ships and establish a lifeline and they build trust and they give love and compassion. These are the meek, the, the, the ones who find themselves thousands of miles, right? From their home and they continue to pray for the safety and the security of those that believe and those who do not. It is the meek who build these boats and in a desert place because God said one day the rain clouds will come. It is the meek who are told to get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee and I will make thee a great nation. Better yet, one day I was out keeping watch over my sheep and when the prophet Samuel approached and anointed me king of all Israel, I did not cease from watching my sheep, nor did I run home and tell my father Jesse, but I remained faithful until the day of the Lord. This is the meek putting God first above all things, not allowing the circumstances and the distractions of the world to dictate how they feel in their life. If we want to draw a correlation, Tracy, if we want to draw a correlation to this, when you think of the Psalm of David, Psalm of David, the 37th Psalm of David, and compare it to Matthew 5 and 4, I believe this is where David is trying to, this is where God is trying to tell us about this particular passage of Scripture. Matthew 5 and 5. And I'm just going to hit a few of these verses, and I want you in your own mind to draw, out, draw a correlation between what we're talking about today, that the blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ooh, a psalm of David. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down, right? Like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it, what? To pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the, dew, as the noonday. And when, you, when we jump down to verse 9, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let me read this again. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. There is something that God is trying to tell us there. He is trying to tell us that even when you pray, praying in supplication, praying continuously for whatever's going on in your own personal life or your family or the world, to pray continuously that you will be rewarded in the end. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of of peace. Hmm. This is my highlight when we think of Psalm 37 because it speaks of several things concerning the meek. It actually speaks highly of the meek, right? It illustrates how the unbelievers, those against Christ, will soon be cut down. They will be no more. Not only cut down, but, but they as an individual, their customs, their evil ways will be no more. They will be remembered no more. Their fledgling hate, their, their mustering up of evil thoughts and murmurings and their treating of God's people, which are the just. Those who have mistreated them will soon be cut down and remembered no more. And so it is, we find this correlation between evil and good. How can you say that there's no God? When all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about uh, 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 winter, right, and summer. It talks about good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness, right? It talks about death and life, right? It talks about sowing and reaping. How can you say that there is no God? There's this great correlation, right, between the hungry and the hungered, right? This, this should be no surprise because it's the Bible, right? A, a book that clearly illustrates that there is righteousness and unrighteousness. There is night and day. There is heat and cold. There is sowing and reaping, war and peace, summer and winter, seed time and harvest. So it is no surprise that there is good and evil. So as us being meek, let us continue to pray to God, ever seeking his face, even during the times of a storm, even during the times of a hurricane, let us be at peace with God, find his eternal peace within us so that we may be able to weather these storms for we cannot do it on our own. Amen. And so we find the psalmist David reminding us not to be intrigued or in awe of these evildoers, nor of their wealth, nor their position in society. No, David is saying that there is something much bigger than all of this. 
David is saying that there is a higher purpose, a, a purpose beyond our own scope, right? Of rational thinking, right? That is to do good, is to be like Christ. Be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm trying to keep this simple. And to do evil is like unto one that sits in high places, wears the best clothing. He is one that sees his own reflection in the mirror, and not of God, but of himself. David is saying that these are those who will wither like the grass and be cut down like the green herb. I know many of you are reading between the lines here. Grass, no matter the season, either is cut down by man or it dies because of lack of rain or what? Too much sun. The green herb like dill and chives and the mint and the parsley and others, if not harvest during the time of their season, soon will be cut down and used for its season during its death. Neither shall be no more. These things, these green herbs will be no more. They will be cut off right? And used so that we may be uh, able to eat them for consumption, right? Nothing lasts forever. David says we should trust in the Lord. In trusting in the Lord, we will have an abundant harvest, some 30, 40, 50, some 100% hundred uh, harvest, which is good for the kingdom of heaven. For we are like trees that should be bearing good fruit. It is the meek, right? That, 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 that is that tree in the corner, right? As uh, uh, if I go back to Pratt, Kansas, and many of you know this story, right? When you think about the Brights and the Washingtons and, uh, right, and, the, and the pear trees, right? Up there on the street, off there off the Hamilton, they, they bore good fruit, right? And in doing so, provided the community with joy and the satisfaction of having fresh fruit. David said that we will always be fed. In other words, when we ourselves produce good fruit, those around us will produce as well. Thank God for these people who provided fruit for the community. If I tell you I love the Lord, the community benefits because there is love in the house, right? If, if a child learns how to prostrate in prayer during their meals and before they sleep at night, guess what? Their children, their children will do the same. If we all decided one day to care for the earth and cease from throwing garbage, right, into the ocean, and if we cease from emitting these gases into the precious ozone layer, we'll begin to see the stars once again. This is a true statement. God said, let us make man in our own image, right? And after our own likeness, let, us have, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth right? That man is supposed to have dominion. We are supposed to cultivate this land so that we may have a good harvest. This is the meek. That we go out and cultivate, that we even on a, on, a, on a sunny day, on a hot day, that we are out working the task that God has set before us, that we may be, have, that we may be able to have a good harvest. Why? Not for our sake, but for the kingdom's sake and for our communities. In other words, God is aware of the meek. For his sheep know his voice and a stranger what they will not follow when I lived in Nigeria there was sometimes when we'd go out into the country we'd see uh, the Fulanis uh, they were uh, pushing their oxen and their sheep and there was always like a young boy maybe of nine or ten years old and he had control over 50 60 80 100 sheep and he has his hat on his head and he has this little stick in his hand and he's in control of his sheep why? For his sheep know his voice, and a stranger they will not follow. I may say, sheep, follow me, and they're like, I don't recognize your voice, but I do recognize that little boy. Amen. And so it is, the meek are those that are following God. They get this, in the shadows, right? The, the meek are the ones in the shadows. I would often wonder why my mother never asked questions of my father in church, right? This is the power of the meek. They are true believers in Christ. They are followers of the good shepherd, and yet they wait for clarity and spiritual direction in the shadows. I need information. I need clarity on this. If, if, if I shout out how I'm feeling right now, this is an emotional stance. No, no, no. Let me go into my secret shadow. Let me go into my secret closet and speak to one who can give me an answer to what I am seeking. So if you draw near to God, he will draw near unto you. When one is able to go into a secret place, a place where uh, he or she can hear the voice of God, they can be spiritually trusted, and it is here where we find truth. 
we find truth when whenever we seek God in our own secret prayer closet or when we seek wise counsel from those who know about God, who can provide a response and a direction for us to take the right path. As I digress, here's a, here's a perfect example of what I'm just saying. When you look at uh, Luke 15, 8 and 10, and it came to pass that a woman who had 10 silver coins lost one. And in her heart, she knows where she might have replaced, misplaced that coin. So she begins to look, right? She sweeps in the shadows of her home, looks under the bed under, uh, uh, by candlelight and takes her hand and gently pushes away the dust and debris and the soil surrounding her in her dwelling place, searching for that which is lost. Now get this, when you read this parable, it doesn't state that the woman went out and said, five or six of her friends and neighbors, come and help me, I have lost my coin. No, I think if I use my own light and use my own ability, I may be able to find that which is lost if I seek wise counsel from above because I have an idea where I lost it. So let me begin to look there. This woman is meek and lowly in heart. What, what, what we should take from this event is that she believes, right? I believe I'm going to find it. She has faith enough to believe that she will find her coin. It may take a few hours. It may take a day or it may take a month. But eventually, because of her faithfulness, she believes she will find that lost coin. And through her faith, God will once again bless that which is lost. Amen. God is looking at our character today when he speaks of the meekness of those in the shadows, those believers who are actively, uh, continuously searching for that which is lost or awaiting for the day that will uh, be made whole and that they will see Christ. This is the meek, the true believers of Jesus Christ, right? They don't run out and seek the assistance of many, right? That can come in and trample that which is lost. But, but, but the meek is the one who carefully looks through the shadows of a darkened home during the day and lights a candle and searches while it is dark. Those are the meek. They are full of faith. They are full of patience, long-suffering, perseverance. And they will, right, preserve that which is lost, which is that thing that lives in the heart, which is Jesus Christ. So these meek. There was once a man, a Roman officer, as I digress, a captain over hundreds and a captain over fifties. Let's call him Cornelius, a centurion of the centurion of the Italian band out of Acts, the 10th chapter. And we do find that, uh, that his prayers had been answered, that his, uh, everything that he, all the prayers that he had sent up to God had been answered. And he's a Gentile. And God says, I want you to send to, I want you to send someone to go and get Peter, right? Cornelius of the Italian band had been praying in supplication, praying for himself and praying for his house, and his prayers had been answered. So these are the meek. So when we speak on these things, the meek, right, as I begin to close. A Mississippi historian by the name of Neil McMillan wrote towards the end of the 20th century, going back to the Great Migration, so far reaching are the effects of the Great Migration that we scarcely understand its meaning. Going back to the Great Migration as I uh, began our, our talk for today, that over six million people over several decades moved from the south, the southern part of the United States into the north. There was something about the meekness, there's something about their spirit that told them that they must move without leadership to go and seek that which is lost. Maybe whatever I am seeking, I will find it. And they trusted in God. But it's not only the African Americans, but it's the Irish, it's the Jewish people, it's, it's everyone who has came to the United States for a specific purpose in time, seeking truth, seeking an answer. These are the meek. And they are worshiping God. They are asking God for truth. God, Lord, Lord, lead me down the right path. Lead me in the direction that you want me to go. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Amen. We serve a God that understands the times, y'all, the times of Jim Crow. And uh, we, we, we felt like, hey, well, well, we got over this, right? We outgrew it. <laughs> uh, the times of miseducation, well, we became overeducated, right? The times of the meek, understanding that they had a voice and a choice, well, we claimed that what was, was ours and we took it. And we have been fighting for it ever since because we have a God who told us that faith without works is dead. 
So the meek are a group of people who do not conform because it's not in them to be enslaved, to be impoverished, or to be overlooked. The meek are those who are seeking Christ at all times, for they know that if they seek Christ first, all things will be added unto them. Amen. So one day Christ died and was buried in a broad tomb, and he rose with all glory and majesty. And we do find that later that on the road to Emmaus, two men, meek, right, bumped into a band, and they didn't know that it was Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus Christ who asked him the question, what manner of communication are you talking about? What, what, what are you talking about? Why are you so sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? Right? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted, right, being meek, that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these days were done. Bear with me for a moment. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were clearly, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found that even so as the woman had said, and he was not there. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, Jesus says, and to enter into his glory? You've read the scripture. You've seen that I have I've raised people from the dead. I have, I've, I've cured their blindness. I've, I've made the lame walk and the, the blind see. Must he not suffer these things and go into glory? Right? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And as I digress, right, when they constrained him to, to follow them even into an inn, into a city that they may uh, eat together, that when Jesus took bread and blessed it, right, and broke it, that they knew him. Oh, and he disappeared from their sight. And the men said, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? So on this journey, right, Jesus expounds to them, tells them about the times of Moses all the way up until the birth, death, and resurrection of himself to the meek, so that they may understand and we do know that when he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, they said, oh, this is the Christ. And he disappeared from their sight. No, their eyes were open. This is the meek today. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, right? Because they are the ones who are praying, praying in supplication. They are praying constantly for, for, for things that other people are not praying for. Praying for safety, right? Praying, praying for security, praying for food safety, praying that people may open their eyes and see the truth. May God bless us and continue to keep us. This God of the meek, he has, he has illustrated his transforming power, right? He digressed through 42 generations and progressed by sitting on the throne of God. Yes, he is the lamb, the precious lamb of God who knows all things, right? He seeks to find a place for all those who truly love him and keep his commandments, right? He was born in a stable in a trough, and he was wrapped in milk rags. And he came to be known as a poor boy from the streets and the ghettos of Nazareth. He was approved of by Moses and Elijah and crowned with glory and honor by a dove. He was nourished with manna from heaven and his thirst satisfied from the wells of Bethlehem. Jesus Christ came to us meek and lowly in heart. And yet the entire world and the universe are controlled by his voice. Amen. This is the God we serve, y'all. He is a God of love. He is a God of compassion, a God of grace, and a God of mercy. And we are the meek. We are the ones that are in the corner oftentimes praying, right? Even though when people think that we're not praying for them, we are praying for them, right? And we're not praying for our own benefit. We're praying because God knows that we should be praying for someone, and he's given us credit for praying for all these things. We should not pray for ourselves. 
No, we have to pray big. Don't, don't, don't just pray for the food that you're about to receive for the nourishment of your body today. Pray for an entire nation across the seas who are starving to death, whether in Asia, in Africa, in Australia, or Europe. Pray for those who are protesting. Pray for those who, who are in need in hospitals right now. Pray for strength for doctors who are right now pushing on someone's chest, trying to save their lives from an uncertain virus. Pray for all these things. Pray for their strength. Pray for their families, right? Pray that they may be able to wake up and see another day, that they may be able to go and serve others to save another life, even though they've lost one today. Pray for those things. Pray for the big things. Pray for an administration. Pray for the governments of North Korea. Pray for the governments of, of Russia. Pray that, they may, that their souls and their eyes will be enlightened, that they may be able to understand what's critical in this world today is the love of Christ and the love of God first, and that we should seek humanity first and not ourselves. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for you have opened our eyes, and, and we do know, Lord Jesus, that we are the meek. We are the ones who are crying out, Lord. We know that, the, that we took it by force one day when you went into heaven, that, that we began to pray and, and we, we, we took heaven by force. Our prayers have inundated heaven with the prayer requests from here into eternity. So thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for providing a message for us today. And I pray that we may uh, go and chew on it and that it may, may be sweet in our mouths and in our belly, that we may be able to tell others about, ooh, this feels so good. I, it feels so good I have to go and tell someone else about the love of Jesus Christ. So thank you today, Lord Jesus, for a reasonable portion of good health and strength. Bless those who are in need today. Bless those who need food today. Bless those who need shelter today, Lord, all over the world, not just in our communities. For someone right now is seeking something to eat right now in Brazil. Someone is seeking uh, clothing and shoes right now in China. Someone is seeking an answer. Someone is seeking Christ right now in Europe. Bless and keep them right now, Lord Jesus, in perfect peace. And we're going to ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And I should have told you uh, before you sign off, uh, we're, uh, we're going to do communion uh, right now. So just bear with us. And if, it, if you want to take, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds if you want to get some water and a cracker and I'll open up our communion here and we're going to do communion. It'll only take about three minutes, but we must do this in remembrance of him. I try to do this every first Sunday of the month uh, to do in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us one day at Calvary, right? Who now sits on the right hand side of the father and, and is anxiously awaiting for us to be with him. So go ahead and take 15, 20 seconds, and I'm going to open up our communion, and then I'm going to read uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, which is our communion. And while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and read this passage of scripture. Isn't it amazing how the sun moves? <laughs> A few moments ago, I was in shade, but look how God works. Amen. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the same night that Jesus Christ was uh, betrayed, that he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it, you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he returns. Wherefore shall, uh, shall eat this bread, wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself, amen. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many are asleep.
So if you have something in your hand, a piece of bread, or if you have some water near you, some juice or whatever, um, let, let, let's do this. Uh, this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. Let us eat together. And we know that uh, he, had took, he took the cup and he said, uh, this represents the blood of my body, represent the New Testament. This is the new covenant that I give unto you, that you love one another, that you love God first and love one another as I have loved you. Let us drink of the cup. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you once again for your message. Thank you for allowing us to come together as men and women of Christ. And I don't know all the circumstances that's going on uh, in everyone's life today, but you know, for you said even when a sparrow falls to the ground, you know about it. And you know all the fowls of the air by name. So you are marvelous, and I fear you for who you are. But in the meantime, I am going to do your perfect will. Each one of us that's on this uh, call right now, and many that will listen later, we will do your perfect will. We will do this in remembrance of you, that we may be able to go out and tell this dying world that you are the Christ, that you came and died for us over 2,000 years ago. And oh, how our hearts burned when we found out who you were, how we went and we were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for who you are today. We thank you for uh, just allowing us to, uh, to be here once again, for tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So go out, continue to bless us and keep us in perfect peace. And Lord, we will be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. So everyone, thanks for uh, stopping by. Uh, Reverend Pitts, thank you for stopping by. My younger brother, Donnell Finley, and uh, Psalm Mabel Love is watching. We have uh, my cousins, Tracy Menace and Shelby Menace Maxwell, who are watching as well. May God continue to bless you. And thank you for supporting this ministry. Um, it's funny uh, that how people now don't refer to me as, uh, you know, they, they don't say, Reverend Finley, I'm watching your sermon or whatever. They say, no, Common Ground Baptist Church. I'm going to tune into Common Ground Baptist Church. So I appreciate that very much because this is not my church. It's God's church. Only he creates churches, right? So we're trying to do his perfect will. So go out and tell someone about how good God has been to you today. And if you're not able to speak to them, do it by actions, right? So God bless you and keep you. I love you very much. Uh, shoot me a text later if you want. Uh, give me a call. Um, bless you and your families, your community. Uh, pray that all is well with Larry. Uh, pray that all is well with Sabine and her husband. Pray that all is well with, with, with Farah and, and Matthias and Terrace and Jaden. Pray that all is well with Travis Pitts and his family. May God bless you and keep you. I love you. Uh, be safe. And we'll see you again next Sunday. Take care. Love you.